Amen. You can have a seat, church. It is good to be with you. i got to start with a question. I think I know the answer, but I just need to hear it from you. But how many would agree in this place today, this morning, that life at times is difficult? If you agree with that life is hard, raise them up right now. Life hard? Okay. All right. You can put them down. Some of you, I don't get it. You didn't have your hand up. It means two things. You're either heavily medicated this morning, right? Could be it. Or you're just not breathing. I don't know which it is, but life for me is difficult at times. In fact, that's one of the big reasons we're in a series called Chain Breaker. Say that word, Chain Breaker. See, God brought you here today because he wants to break some chains in your life. I believe that. Like Kendra said, if you're new here, if this is your first time stepping into Meadows Church, man, I'm glad you're here. Welcome home. If you're, if you're back for more, welcome back. I'm excited. Th th this epic summer series has been incredible, and God's just getting started. So life is hard, and we have chains, but God is breaking chains today, and that's why he brought you here, and that's what you need to know, and he's just getting started. So as, as we gear up, we, we, we're in week five of a 12-week series, and, and it's step by step by step, and steps matter. Steps matter. So if you missed any of the, the messages, you can catch them at meadows.church, our website. You can catch them on our YouTube channel. If you haven't subscribed to that, do that. You'll get all of our content, but you can catch up to where we are today. But step five, we're on right now, and it's a big deal. Like I said, you don't want to skip steps. Directions matter. Like, directions for me are a struggle. I've, I've talked about this before, but for me, driving around and navigating, it, it's, it's ugly. You know, like, now we have GPS, but before we had GPS, it was bad. I, I moved from Sioux Falls, South Dakota, to be a part of this church plant about a year ago. And in Sioux Falls, years ago, I used to golf more. And um, me, and, me and my buddies had a tea time one time, and... They know that I struggle with directions. They called me, and this was before uh, smartphones. And they called me, and they said, Monty, we've golfed this newer course before. And I've golfed it before. And they said, but here's how you get there, because they knew I'd struggle. So he gave me a step-by-step -step synopsis of how to get to Spring Creek Golf Course in Sioux Falls. And I'm like, dude, I get it. I've been there before. But they know I struggle. But I'm like, yeah, whatever. So I wasn't really listening. Well, I hang up, and I start driving to Spring Creek, and... Uh, so I get to where the golf course is, but the golf course isn't there. So either they moved the golf course, or I wasn't really listening to directions. I was in the wrong spot. So I'm, I knew I was close. So I'm driving around Sioux Falls, and I'm, it's in the outskirts somewhere, and I'm driving, I'm driving, I'm driving, and finally I'm kind of out in the country. And I'm like, okay, I, I'm really off base here. So uh, I'm going to miss my tea time. So I, I finally pull into a farmhouse, and a guy's outside. And this is, so I, I, said, I tell the guy, I said, hey, I'm looking for Spring Creek Golf Course. He goes, never heard of it. And I said, well, it's a newer course in Sioux Falls. And he goes, Sioux Falls, South Dakota? I said, yeah. He goes, son, you're in Iowa. I'm like, oh, my gosh. Kidding me. I literally ended up in a different state looking for, missed my tea time, obviously. But uh, I struggle. The life, I, life is difficult for me. But steps matter. Last week, we looked at step four. Step four, if you missed it, we really just said all the things that have happened in my life that I've done or that's been done to me, I'm going to write down on paper. I'm going to put it down. And that brings us to step five. Because there's things in our life that happen to us that sometimes we repress and we push down. But when you get it out on paper, you, God starts to do something. And man, it was, a, it was a powerful, emotional thing last week. If you missed that, you can check it out. But it leads us to step five. Step five is this, and we'll put it up. Step five in recovering from our hurts, our habits, our hangups is this. We admitted, say admitted. Admitted, we're admitting something. We admitted to God, to ourselves, and to another human being the exact nature of our wrongs. We admitted to God, to our, myself and to another human being, all those things that I wrote down or that are gone wrong in my life, I'm admitting those. I'm admitting them. Help me preach this morning. Turn to somebody and tell them, confess your mess. Turn to somebody and say, confess your mess. You've got a mess and so do I. And we're talking about confession. Step five is about confessing. So I grew up when I was in South Dakota, I grew up in a small town, Salem, South Dakota, and I grew up Catholic. So I went to Catholic grade school up through eighth grade. There were things I loved about Catholic school, like every day, blue pants, a white shirt, a red sweater. Every day I was like, I never had to be concerned about what I was wearing. I knew what I was wearing. But something I didn't like was confession time. Because about, by the time you get to third grade, I think it is, you go to confession. And it's just like you might see in the movies or on TV. You go in there, and there's the screen, and the priest is on the other side. And uh, I remember as third graders, we would line up 
it, for confession, and there's the confessional. And I'd purposely try to get like behind one of my heathen friends. That way, if they go first, you know, he hears all their junk, and then I, I don't look so bad. So yeah, I'm always thinking ahead. But that's what I would do. And I, I remember I, I would in, in third grade getting, and it's my turn. I step in there, and there's the screen, and he's behind there, and I'm getting ready to confess my third grade sins. And what do you do? I mean, it's third grade. It's not, it's, it's not like I was knocking off liquor stores and manufacturing meth in my basement, right? That didn't start till junior high. But this is third grade. So, so I go in there, and I remember telling him things like, um, you know, let's see, uh, I guess I made Jenny cry in the playground. You know, I, I made fun of her, and she bawled. Okay, that's bad. I'm the one that shot spit walls at the teacher. That, that was me in math class. Um, Let's see, uh, thinking, thinking, thinking. My mom asked me if I washed my hands before dinner. I told her I did, but I didn't. Right? I lied. And so you're telling him these things, but the priest says, I want you to be specific. So not only do you tell him what you did, but he wants to know how often you did it. So, and so that's what he said, and he, he's telling you, be specific. So if I said I lied to my mom, he says, well, how many times have you lied over the last three months? And I'm thinking to myself, I don't know. I mean, it's not like I'm keeping some sort of a log every time I tell a lie. One second, you know, let me jot this down in my sin journal and uh, put it down. I'm not doing that. I have no clue. So now I'm lying to the priest, making numbers up. I don't know. But this is confession. It was intimidating, and I hated it. So when I was out of high school, many of you know I left the church. Like, I, had, I wanted nothing to do with it. And I don't blame the church. It was me. I just, I just, I had other things on the agenda at 18. So I left that. And I remember thinking, no more confessing. No more going to a priest. And, and I remember thinking, you don't even need to do that. That's not even, you, you, I can confess to God. He, God knows what I've done. I confess to him. He forgives me. And that's true. That is true. When you confess your sins to God, he is faithful and he'll forgive you. So whatever you walked in here with today, whatever struggle you carry, because I'm carrying things in my life. I don't know about you, but I'm carrying things today. And you can, you can confess them to God today, and the Bible says he'll forgive you like that. That's how good he is. That is how good your God is. However, there's always a however. However, if you want to heal today from hurts, if you want to heal from the things you've written down maybe in a fourth step, or things that have been done to you or that you've done, if you want to heal there's more. Someone say, there's more. There's more. There's more. I'm going to show you what I'm talking about right now because the Bible says this. Check it out. James 5, 16. This blew me away when I read it for the first time. And I heard this. Confess your sins to each other and pray for each other so that you may be healed. There are people walking around today that, that they, they're forgiven of their sins, but they're bleeding, they're hurting, and they're broken on the inside because they haven't confessed to somebody else. It's so key that you catch this. You could be forgiven and still broken because you haven't healed, because you haven't told somebody else about it. That's why this is so key. So if you're taking notes, there's a couple things that you're going to get right away. Confessing to God always equals forgiveness. I already told you that. Today you walked in here with deep, dark secrets, things that maybe no one else knows about. Today you can confess them to your father today, and he will forgive you. It is a guarantee. The other thing that is a guarantee is this. When you confess to others, confessing to others equals healing. When you confess to somebody else, healing will begin in your life. I don't know about anybody else in this place. I can't speak about you, but I can speak about me. There are things in my life that I needed to heal from. Still some things that I'm healing from. Things that I've, that I've done or that have been done to me. And you need to confess those to somebody else. I always thought it was funny because step five says to another human being. And I'm like, okay, I mean, duh. I'm not going to, what, am I going to find an alien and talk to him about it? Yeah, duh, human. But then I realized we're, people are crazy. So the, the Bible specific. Step five is specific. You know why? Because of that. Because we're nuts. I, I remember going to do a recovery meeting with a gal. And she's talking about her step five thing. She's like, yep, I've confessed my sins. And we're like, well, who did you confess to? She goes, I confess everything to my dog. I said, your dog? That's what she said. She's confessing all of her deep, dark junk to her dog. I'm like, think about that. Not only does your dog have to see all the stupid stuff you do throughout the, throughout the day, now he has to hear about the things that he doesn't see? I mean, okay, number one, you're weird. Number two, your dog now needs counseling. I mean, this is wrong. Stop it. My gosh, you're torturing your dog. Don't do that. You confess to another human being. It's so key. And I'm going to tell you something. As I prepare prayed for you for this message the scripture that you're going to get I, I i did that wasn't my plan but it was god's i want if you brought a bible or a mobile like a phone with a bible app go to luke 15 so luke is in the new testament luke 
um, is, is, is one of the four gospels. Gospel literally means good news. Why? Because Jesus is good news. And all four of the gospels tell the story of Jesus Christ's life. A man who was also God who lived on the earth, who had struggles like you and I, who had hurts like you and I, who, who had chains like you and I. They just didn't hold him down. I want to learn from this guy. Luke 15, verse 11. As I set this up, i got to tell you that Jesus was asked a question. And it was by Pharisees, by religious people. You know, people that was wondering why Jesus would hang with the people he hung out with. Like, he, they always asked him, why would you hang with such scum? Why do you hang with such sinners? Why do you hang with such losers? You know what I love about Jesus? Because that, that, all that, that's me, man. That, that's who I am. I'm like, I'm the least of these. And Jesus would hang out with me and you. Why? Because Jesus cared about people that nobody else cared about. Do you know that? Jesus cared about the people nobody else cared about. And that's why he did it. So he was trying to make a point to these religious people. And tell them, this is why I do what I do. And he tells three stories. And the third story is the story called uh, the prodigal son. You might have heard it growing up. If you grew up in the church, maybe you heard it. What you may not know, though, is prodigal, we think it means lost. And that could be a loose translation. But prodigal literally means wasteful. The word prodigal means wasteful. So his son was wasteful in this story. And Jesus is describing to these religious people, the people that got it all up here, and they ain't got nothing here. I've been there. I don't know about you. I've had head, head knowledge about Jesus. I knew about him. I believed about him. Nothing. Nothing there. That's where the Pharisees were. They had all kinds of head knowledge. Very smart. Wasn't in their heart. Let me start in the 11th verse. Jesus says, let me illustrate this further to you guys. Jesus said, I'm going to tell you a story. A man had two sons. The younger son told his father, you know what, dad? I want my share of the stuff now. I want my, my things now before you die. So, the father agreed to divide the wealth between the two sons. Now, what you need to understand about this right off, right off the bat is that it would be very rare for, for the estate to be divided before the father died. And if it ever was divided before the father passed away, it would be the father initiating it, not the son. So, the fact that the younger son said, Dad, I'll take my stuff now is a huge statement of disrespect, a huge statement of dishonor. In fact, basically, he's saying, Dad, screw you. Screw you, I'm going to do it my way. I'll take my stuff. I'll take my inheritance. I'll take my trust fund. I'm going my way. That's basically what he's saying to his dad. You know, and sometimes as, as kids, sometimes as teenagers, got it all figured out. I remember growing up in the Midwest, I always wanted to live somewhere else. I'm like, I'm going to go to California. I'm going to go to New York. I mean, I don't know what I was thinking, actually. But, you know, that, that it's always, the grass is always greener somewhere else. Well, for the prodigal son, for this younger son, he's thinking, I'm going that way because it's better that way. So, dad, cough it up. Verse 13, a few days later, the younger son, after he got all of his stuff from dad, he packed everything and he did just what we're talking about. He took his stuff and he moved to a distant land. The further, the better. I'm out of here. And there he wasted. There it is, wasted, wasteful. Man, there's so much of my life I look back and I think, I wasted so much. Some of you might feel that way today. I've wasted so much of my life. That's why God brought you here because he's going to start restoring maybe what you think you wasted. That's what God wants to do today. I wasted, I wasted my money on wild living. The Bible, I like it. It doesn't really say what he did, this wild living. I mean, it's kind of censored, but we can guess it's kind of graphic. Right, wild living, you ever, I don't know if you, you, any of you ever had a wild past, or maybe you are living a wild present right now. You know what I'm saying? I've been there. Things in my past that I don't want to remember, things in my past I can't remember. I mean, I've been there, wild living. My, my wife Jody and I have been married Gosh, 15 years in November. So 14 years we've been married and uh, our honeymoon. This was, I was living a wild um, lifestyle right now. Our honeymoon, we went to Mexico to a resort. And uh, I don't, I debated on telling the story, but we're, let's just do it. So, um, okay, so we go and uh, the last night of our resort, I, I, wild living, right? I, 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 I got a little wild. I met a friend, his name's Jose uh, Cuervo, and turns out... <laughs> Turns out he wasn't a friend of mine uh, because uh, he, he wasn't a nice guy. So met him and uh, we got to know each other really well, but things ended badly. And uh, so my wife and I got separated. Um, I got separated. So she's back at our room. So this is, a, again, you can't make this up. So I go back to the room and, I, and I'm like talking to my wife. And I do remember this part because, and I had on these nice clothes and nice khakis. And my wife looks at me as I walk in the room. She goes, she goes, what happened to you? And I said, what do you mean what happened to me? She goes, what happened to your pants? I said, my pants? And I looked down, and I kid you not, half of my pants were missing. Half of my pants. 
from the pant leg down was completely gone. Gone. Pocket sticking out, and it was not a fashion statement. Half my pants were missing. Half. How do you do this? I have no idea how it happened. I tell people, when I tell the story, I think, I tell them I just got attacked by a Mexican mountain lion. And I could have. I don't know. That could have happened. I have no idea. That is a true story. We don't know. I thank God every day that social media did not exist during this time. Thank you, God. I wouldn't be your pastor. If they pull that stuff up, they're like, that dude ain't preaching nothing. It was nuts. How do you lose half your, I don't know. Anyway, I got off track. Wild living. So, here we go, verse 14. About the time the money ran out, so he's doing this wild living, he's lost half his pants, the money's ran out, a great famine sweeps over the land, and he began to starve. He persuaded a local farmer to hire him. Guy sent him into the fields to feed the pigs. Something you need to understand about that is, too, if this is a Jewish boy, they'd have nothing to do with pigs in this time. Like, pigs were a disgusting, disgraceful animal. A dirty swine. They, they didn't eat pork. They would, never be, they would never touch a pig. But yet, here's this guy. This is what he's got. This, is, this picture is unbelievable. Verse 16. The young man became so hungry that even the pods, even the food he was feeding the pigs, looked good. But no one gave him anything. Pause. The scene that... that, that, that Jesus is painting in this story is very dark and very grim right now. What you, like this guy is in a pig pen with the pigs. And I think God is giving us an illustration here of sin. Of what sin does in our lives. Because sin is so deceiving. How do you think it got Adam and Eve in the first place? Deception. See, the, the, the devil showed them a fruit and he made the fruit look really, really good. But sin can look really, really good. Did you know that? That's why you go there. It can, I, I've said it before, sin will fascinate you before it assassinates you. It's what it does. It's what it's in the business of doing. That's why you go back to it, because it looks so good, and this time it's going to be different, and this time it's going to feel better, and this time I won't end up there. Yes, you will. You'll end up farther, farther down where you've ever been before, I promise you. Sin, this what sin, what did it do for the boy? Think about it. Why did he leave? Success. Sin promises success. What did it deliver him in the pen? Failure. Sin promises satisfaction. What did it deliver him? Starvation. Promises freedom. It brought him slavery. I'm telling somebody, see, the world, can, you know, it'll give you temporary relief, but it cannot provide you with true freedom. See, only Jesus Christ can give you that. He's the only one. He's the only one. And this guy, the son bought it hook, line, and sinker. He, he took the bait, just what the devil wanted him to do. But it wasn't done yet. Verse 17, check it out. He finally came to his senses. Boy, that's a good day. When he finally came to his senses, he said to himself, at home, even the servants, not even the sons, but the servants have food on the table. But I am here, and I'm dying of hunger. And, and, and literally, he probably was. I mean, he was probably literally starving to death. Right? Unlike when my kids tell me they're dying of hunger, all that means is they haven't ate for 30 minutes. That's it. That's all that means. That literally, the other day, we're cleaning up lunch, and Ava's like, Dad, I'm starving. I'm like, well, there's still food on the plate. Here, eat it. Turns out she was starving for ice cream. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> Whatever. So, but this guy was literally starving to death. He is dying of hunger. Verse 18. I will go home to my father, and I'll say, Father... I've sinned, to both he I've sinned against both heaven and you. I'm no longer worthy of being called your son. Please just take me on as your hired hand. Please just take me on as your hired servant. Verse 20. So he did that. He did just what he said. He returned home to the father. And he said just that. While he was still. Oh, first let me add this. This is key. Oh, this is key. While he was still a long way off, the father saw him coming. How did the father see him coming from a long way off? Because the father was looking for the son. I would venture to say every day the father would go out and just search and pray that the son would come home. Because he saw him not from a short way off. He didn't knock on the door saying, Dad, I'm home. But the father saw him from a long way off. See, for somebody in this place, you're wondering if, you're, if your heavenly father is even caring about what's going on in your life. Caring about what's going on with your kids or your family or your job. And I'm here to tell you, he cares for you. He loves you. He's looking out for you. He's watching for you. He's waiting for you, wanting to love you. That's what your father says about you. That's what he wants for you. The father saw him from a long way off. I love it. So the father sees him from a long way off. The father saw him coming, filled with love and compassion. 
just like your father is filled with love and compassion for you. He ran to his son. He embraced his son, and he kissed him. His son said to him, Father, I've sinned against both heaven and you. I'm no longer worthy to be called your son. But the father said to the servants, Quick, bring this guy the finest robe in the house. Put, a, put it on him. He said, Get a ring for his finger. Get sandals for his feet. He keeps going, kill the fatted calf. We must celebrate with a feast for my son was lost or my son was dead and now he's returned to life. My son was lost and now he's found. I love this. So let the party begin. See that statement right there? That's why Meadows Church will always be a church that will look less like a funeral and more like a party. We always will be because we have something to celebrate. Because you know what in this church? Lost people come home. Dead people come back to life. Last week, Kendra probably already shared, four people made decisions for Christ in our church. Just the beginning of what God wants to do in his church. I love it. And they celebrated. They celebrated him coming home. It's so key. But you might be thinking, Pastor, what about step five? I get that the lost have come home, the dead have come back to life. But step five, isn't that about confession? Are we talking about admitting all of our junk to somebody else? Where does that fall into the story? Let me make sure you caught it. Put back up verse 21 if we got it. His son said to the father, Father, I have sinned against both heaven, against my God, and against you. He's admitting it to himself. He's already admitted it to himself earlier. He's admitting it to his dad and to his God. I have sinned against heaven and you. I'm no longer worthy to be called your son. But the father, the father doesn't even give this guy time to confess everything. He says, you know what? Let's celebrate. He, the, he doesn't even finish his confession. And his father says, we're going to celebrate. Isn't that awesome? And the celebration began. You know what else began that day? The healing. The healing would begin that day in the sun. The healing would begin that day. But you know what's something I wrote down? I put this down. I said, you've got to recognize you're broken before you recognize your need for healing. So I want to take, I want to take just a, um, a left turn just for a second. It's not too much of a left turn, I promise you. But something that God showed me in this passage for you today, and I truly believe that this is for somebody specifically. I believe it with all my heart. Because it was so strong. Can we go back to the pig pen for a second? Can we go back to him? Remember him in the pig pen with the, with the pigs? When he's in there and he's looking at the pig food, and he says, even that looks pretty good. Remember what, the, remember what the Bible said? The Bible said, no one gave him anything. And I thought, that's so interesting. No one gave, no one gave this son not even pig food. What we don't hear in this scripture, we, we never hear that the father, we know he was looking for the son. We never hear that he left to go searching for the son, did he? The, well, that's so interesting. The father wasn't going from town to town. You would think, my gosh, my son, he's out of control. This wild living, this drunkenness, this parties, all this craziness. I'm going to go. I got to find him. I got I to gotta get him out. I got to help him. The father never does that. He never goes from town to town and place to place, knocking on door to door saying, have you seen my son? Where is he at? We never see him doing that. Isn't that interesting? He doesn't, he doesn't wire him any money. I mean, his, 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 his son's dead broke. He has nothing. Why wouldn't the father be there to feed him? I mean, he's, he would probably have heard what's going on. But the father doesn't do that. Oh, you can, you can bet the father's praying for him. You can bet the father's waiting for him. You can bet the, 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 the father's wanting him. But he doesn't go after him. And it's so interesting. And I, and I think that, I don't think, I know. See, sometimes when you have no other option, like the son had no other option. Dad wasn't there. No one else was there to help. I have nothing else to do. Sometimes when you have no other option, that is the best option. That, that, that is the best option. Like, like when no one, there's nobody else I can call. There's nowhere else I can turn. There's nobody else who can help. See, sometimes in that moment you come to a place of brokenness. Recognize then your need for healing. And then you just might run to the arms of a father who's been waiting for you to come home. It takes broken to reach beautiful, doesn't it? That's what it did for him. I, 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 I got to I said it again. No one gave him anything. Sometimes I think we get our role and God's role mixed up, don't we? I got to save them. I just got to save them. 
I'm going to be there. I'm going to, I'm going to, uh, you know, I, I see people in relationships. Maybe he knows Jesus and she doesn't know Jesus. Well, I'm going to bring him to Jesus. Good luck. Good luck. You ain't saving anybody. Okay? That's Jesus' job. Your job is to serve them. Your job is to love them. Your job is to walk with them. Your job is to pray for them. Your job is to wait for them. Your job ain't to save them. Okay? And sometimes the best thing you can do is say, you know what? I love you. I'm waiting for you. But maybe you need to get to a place where there's no other options. Okay? Maybe you just need to get to that place. I don't know who I'm preaching to right now. I just know in my life, that's what it was for me. Okay? Some of you know the story, but some are new. And God's taking a drug addict and somehow giving him a platform at Meadows Church to preach to you. So I'm in Sioux Falls 11 years ago in addiction, hiding it from everybody. Crazy. Just crazy. Wild living. Thought I knew what was best. You know, it's kind of like the son in the story. So I'm driving down this main street in Sioux Falls, and I'm bawling. And I've cried out to God numerous times, forgive me. And God's like, I forgive you, but you need to turn. You need to turn. And God, in this moment in my car, he did something that we're talking about in today's story. He gave me uh, the encouragement and the power and the, the willingness. And I'll say the brokenness. I'll say that. That's the best word I can describe. When, when somebody struggles with whatever it is, you could say drug addiction, you could say uh, porn, you could put whatever you want, shopping. I don't care what you put in there. We all got issues. Let's just say it. Okay? Can we admit it? I can't. This is a place where it's okay to not be okay. And I, I, I'm not going to pretend like I got it all together because I'm far from it. Okay? Until we recognize our need, recognize our brokenness, then we can start to receive the healing that God has for us. And I'm driving in my car 11 years ago, heavily addicted to drugs, using it on a daily basis. I cannot stop. And nobody knew. I mean, besides maybe the handful of people that I would party with. And I'm driving, and it's a common scene. I've cried out to God numerous times. And God in this moment said, you need to go drive home and tell somebody. Admit. You have to admit it to another human being. And I didn't want to. You need to understand. See, addiction or anything will do anything to stay alive. That's what sin does. It wants to destroy because the devil is behind that. And the Bible says what the devil will do is he wants to kill, steal, and destroy. It's all he wants. Trust me. Okay. This is, so I went to rehab twice. The second time, I, was, I got real close to a gal that was in there. My wife met her. She, we, she was my age. She was, her husband was struggling with her addicted. My wife was struggling with me addicted. So we got really close. And as I put this message together for you, I hadn't heard it from her in years. And I remember thinking, I wonder where she's at, you know, because I'm thinking about her and how we went through rehab together. And I figured she might be divorced because she really had, I mean, we both had huge struggles. So I look it up this week and uh, I'm friends with her husband on Facebook. Or I saw his Facebook post about his wife and it said, happy heavenly birthday. So then I Google her name and she died five years ago. And I'm like, anyway, kill, steal, and destroy. It is, it is no game, and it's not, it's not just drugs. It's whatever is in your way right now. Whatever hurt, habit, or hang-up that you're dealing with, the devil wants to use it to take you out. And what he wants to do is he wants you to conceal your sin. I'll guarantee you. Some of you, you got deep, dark things going on in your heart and in your life, and all the devil wants you to do is say, you know what? Don't tell anybody that. They're not going to accept you. They're going to make fun of you. They're going to judge you. They're not going to include you. You can't do that. No one's ever done what you've done. No one is as bad as you are. If they knew what you did, you can't. Tell them. That's what he kept telling me. Monty, you've got kids. You've got a wife. You've got a job. Hundreds of people will be impacted by your drug addiction that you've hidden. You cannot tell them. But when you get to a place where there's no other options, when you're in the pen with the pigs, I tell people, when you've been in a pit, man, then you'll know what it's like to get out of one. I was in a pit, and I had nowhere to go but down. And I'm driving, and I drive home, and I walk up the stairs in our bedroom, and I tell Jody, and I say, this is what's going on. This is why we're going to counseling. This is why we struggle. This is why I'm not a great dad. This is why I suck as a husband. And she, you could have just, I mean, it's like someone just kicked her right in the gut. You want to talk about pain. But you've got to get to that point of pain before you can get to that point of healing. Okay? And sometimes, and the devil, what he wants to do is, it's going to be too painful. It's going to be too messy. It's going to be too hard. Don't do it. You've got to do it. 
Whatever you haven't confessed, whatever's in your heart, whatever's deep in you, you need to know this is a place where it's okay to not be okay. And this is a place where you can come to God and you can come to somebody else and say, this is where I'm at. This is what I've done. This is who I've hurt. And this is a place where we won't judge you, but we'll, like the Father, welcome home. Welcome home. Put on the robe. Put on the ring. Put on the sandals because we love you and there's hope for you because God's still on the throne and God is not done with you. He's not. He's not. So I tell Jody what happened. And, and I tell her, this is where I've been and this is what I've done. It's a miracle we're together, okay? By the grace of God, I think God sent me that angel. It's a miracle we're together. But that's where the healing started. And I remember thinking, there's no way, I, I tell people all the time, if I was in my addiction by myself, I would be dead. I would be dead. I'm telling you this. Thank God I had a family. Thank God I had friends who loved me. Thank God I had a family who wouldn't give up on me. Thank God I had a wife who was always there for me. Thank God my kids. Thank God. This is why you need each other. This is why I need you in my life. This is why we need, this is why I talk about life groups, our small groups here at the church. You need a life. If you're not in one, I pray you'll, do, you'll get in one today. We want to walk with you. We want to do life with you. I really do. I don't want to just preach for an hour and then go home and you live your own life and I'll live mine and we come back and meet next week. I don't want that. I want to do life with you. I want you to know it's okay to not be okay. I want you to know you can confess whatever you want. And this is a place where you can come home and say, God, this is what I've done. He already knows it. You just need to tell somebody else about it. But relationships are so key. I wrote it down. I said, you will never live out your purpose. This is a, we are a purpose-driven church. You have a purpose, by the way. If you don't know that, you do. God created you on purpose for a purpose. You will never live out your purpose by yourself. You need a friend to pace you, push you, encourage you, and love you. You need more than just a friend. You need a family. I want to be your, we want to be your family. I want to do life with you. It's okay to not be okay. If I was by myself, I would be a dead man. If the son had nobody else in the story, he would be a dead man. You might be like, what? What do you mean the son would be a dead man? Did you know? It's interesting. The son comes home and the father sees him. In, in the East culture, especially back in this day, old men would never run. Never. Even today in the East, they would, you would never find an old man running. But yet this father runs to the son. Why? You know why? Because, well, number one is obvious. He hates his son. He saw him coming. He's going to go out. He's happy. He's excited. He's going to celebrate. But the second thing you may not see, because what you need to understand is because of what the son did to the father and his family, he would be guilty. When you rebel like that as a child, you're guilty. That is guilty, and that's a disgrace. You know, you know, what, the, you know what the penalty is? Stoning. I always tell my kids, kids, it could be a lot worse than you got it right now. I'll tell you what, if you look back in this day, I'm just saying, they, they rebelled, you, you'd be stoned. So why does the father run to the son? Number one, he's excited. Number two, he wraps his arms around the son and he embraces him. What is he doing? Not only loving him, but protecting him. Because the villagers could have easily saw the son coming and started to stone the son in a second. And, be, and that would be legal. That would be like the right thing to do because of what he did to the family, what he did to disgrace them, they could stone him. But the father says, you ain't touching him. You got to get through me to get to the son. You stone him, you stone me, but you're not touching my son. That's what God says to you today. I love you so much. I love you so much. I want to I wanna love you. I want to save you. I want to protect you. I want to be there for you. And he is. But it's interesting. So you got to get to the father to get to the son. It, it makes me think of my closing verse that I have for you. John 14, 6. It's, it's one of my favorite scriptures. I say that every week, don't I? But I got a lot of favorite scriptures. Just bear with me. It's all good. John 14, 6. Jesus is speaking. He says, I am the way, I am the truth, and I am the life. No one comes to the Father unless they go through me. Isn't that interesting? So you got to get, you got to get, you got to go through the Son to get to the Father. It's like, but, but the Father and the Son, I don't want to confuse you, but they're, they're one. See, it's a relationship. The, 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 the Father, the Son, the Holy Spirit, three in one. That's why, see, God is modeling something for you and I today, that we need each other. The Father needs the Son, even in heaven. And the Son needs the Father in heaven. And he says in John 14, 6, you got to, to get to the Father in heaven, you got to go through the Son. That's why, that's why with my kids all the time, I'll quiz them. I'm a pastor, I got to do it. And I'll say, hey, how do you get to heaven? And they used to say, well, God. I said, no, you got to be more specific. I said, no. I want to, Dad, I want to tell that answer. They said, Jesus. I said, now you're on to something. 
There's a, there's a lot of people worshiping, worshiping God today that will never see the gates of heaven. Okay? I don't know what God they're worshiping. I don't know. My God is three in one. My God is also Jesus Christ, who is God and man. That's my God. There's a huge difference. If, you're, if, if you believe in God, but you don't believe that Jesus Christ is his son that was sent from him, that was fully God and fully man, that he died for you and rose for you and is coming back again, that's the game changer. I know, I know people that believe in God, but not, not that Jesus is God's son. And I, do every, I pray for them. I, I, I love them. I encourage them. But that's not the answer. The answer is Jesus Christ. The only way to the Father is through the Son. And it parallels the story that we heard today about the prodigal son. Think about it. The son was lost. Just like some of you might feel lost in the moment. The son was lost. Jesus says, I am the way. The son was senseless. That's what the Bible said. He came to a senseless. He came to a senses. Jesus says, you need to know I am the truth. The son was dead in a pen. Dead on the inside. Just like some of you might be dead today and like I was dead in my car that day. And Jesus says, I am the life. I am the resurrection. I am the life. Whoever believes in me will not perish, but will have life and have it to the full. And I just need to know today, does anybody in this place want that kind of life? It's here. He's here and it's available. It's available to you today. So as I close out the message, I'm going to pray for you. What are the takeaways today, Pastor? Number one, Jesus Christ is Lord. And if he's not Lord of your life, if you, don't, if you haven't accepted him as Lord and Savior, that just means I believe in you, Jesus. I love you. I want you in my life. I want you in my heart. I, wanna, I, I want your spirit inside of me. You can do that today. You can do that today. You can make that decision today. That means heaven will be your home. The only way to the Father is through the Son. I believed in Jesus all my life. I've been following him for 11 years. Okay? There's a big difference between believing because the devil believes, right? The devil believes in Jesus. He ain't going to heaven. He's not going to heaven. Surrender. The son finally surrendered and went to the father. Today, God is saying to you, will you surrender the life that you think is going to provide you success, the life that you think is going to provide you fullness, the life that you think is going to provide you with happiness, and surrender it to me, and I will show you life like you've never seen that's step one. Step two, confession. After we worship this last song, we'll have a prayer team scattered up here that want to pray with you, that you can confess to. Everything's confidential. I'm here to tell somebody. I know there's somebody in this place, more than one person. There's something deep inside of you that you've never, you've never had the courage to tell anybody that's happened to you or that you've done. Today is your day. You walk out of here healed or you walk out of here on the process of getting healed. It's got to come out. This is why God brought you here. You need to know this is a safe place, and you need to know how much you're loved and how valuable you are. The Father looked for the Son. Today, God looks for you to come and confess, to come and give Him everything you've got, and watch what He does. He loves you so much. Let me pray for you. Father, I thank you so much for the story, for, for, first of all, for these 12 steps of recovery that just aren't about addiction. They are about life. They're all based on your word of God. And today we see that when we confess, like the son confesses to you and confesses to the father, that the healing begins. Not only does the healing begin, God, but the party begins. For some people in this place, God, they can't remember the last time they felt real joy. They can't remember the last time they felt that way, that the, the life that you promised they might be existing, but maybe they're not living. Today is a new day. God, I pray for everybody in this place that they will have the courage to confess to another person that they trust. And I hope they know anybody in this church that is on our team, our prayer dream team. They can trust them. We will love them. We will walk with them. We won't judge them, God. We will celebrate. We will celebrate the courage they had to come forward and say, this is what I've done. This is what's been done to me. I need help. And we will love them, God. We will get the robe. We'll get the ring. We'll get the sandals. And we will celebrate. For anybody in this place, God, who hasn't accepted you as their Lord and Savior, they might like me. They might believe in you. But, but yet, if they look at their life compared to everybody else in the world, they don't live any differently. That was me. I talk the same way as everybody else. I act the same way as everybody else. I party like everybody else. I, I, I might talk a big game for an hour on Sunday, but you know who I was, God. Like the Pharisees, I was a hypocrite. 
I, I, I would know you, and I'd, I'd preach to others about you, but there was nothing in my heart about you. I had surrendered nothing. God, I pray for the person today that maybe they're like that. There's a belief in there, but they haven't surrendered. Like the son finally surrenders and goes home, runs home. I'm praying that somebody will surrender their will and their wants to you and know that you, you, don't, have, you don't want nothing from them. You have total, abundant life for them. Father, have your way in this place as we worship you. I know your spirit's already moving. I thank you for what he's doing and what he'll continue to do throughout this service, God. We love you so much. We believe in you and that the best is truly yet to come. In Jesus' name I pray. And everybody says, hey, wherever you are, thanks so much for joining us today. We are so glad that you did. And if this blessed you in any way, man, we would love for you to subscribe to this channel, follow us on social media, and stay connected with us. And let me say most importantly, if you are ready to give your life to Christ or you want to make a decision for Jesus today, we would love it, man. Connect with us. Contact us at hello at meadows.church. Again, hello at meadows.church. Let us know what God is doing in your life. And know this, God loves you and the best is truly yet to come.